Well, welcome everybody to another episode of uh, Holy Smokes, Cigars and Spirituality. I'm Christian Smith, the heretic, the host. As you can see, I got my Holy Smokes, Cigars and Spirituality mask on. I'm definitely not wearing this the whole time because, you know, I got to smoke my cigar, but I just wanted to stunt for a second and show y'all. So let me take it off now so I can get to the business at hand. Wear your mask. Stay safe. You might save somebody else's life, including yours. Um, so we're excited to be here for another episode. I'm Christian, the heretic, the host, proud to be a part of Holy Smokes, proud to do it with these awesome, incredible, incredible, wonderful people that we have. Um, thank you to everybody who continues to support um, in every way, watching, commenting, sharing, everything. We appreciate your support. Those of you who watch on Patreon and those of you who listen on the various podcast platforms, please continue to tell people about it. And some of the wonderful things that we're doing here at Holy Smokes, what we do here is create disruptive faith-based content for the everyday person. And that's one of the reasons, if you've been listening to, uh, listening to us up to this point while we have the dollar jar, because we want to make it for the everyday person. And the reality is we have people on our cast who just aren't everyday people. A uh, great example will be the Kingmaker. He's not an everyday person, so he doesn't use everyday words. So that's why we have the dollar jar. So when the Kingmaker, with his non-everyday self, uses a non-everyday word, we can dock him. And we're going to take those dollars and at some point give them to charity. Thank you, Kingmaker. Anyway. Today's topic, you gonna say something, Kingmaker? Was there something you wanted to say? I was gonna say it, but I realized that I got people from my church watching. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just let you have this one. You 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 have free reign. Go right ahead. Our daddy great. It's all yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so today is a very, very exciting episode. Um I think it was either earlier this year or late last year, we did an in-person Holy Smokes gathering on this topic. And it was the most well-attended session we had and it lasted the longest and we couldn't finish it. So today we're talking about sex. Everybody likes to talk about sex, but nobody likes to admit it. We're gonna just put it out there and talk about it. Uh, so I want to give everybody an opportunity to introduce themselves. We have most of our crew here today. Uh, we're only missing Greg DeLoach, the Bearded Sage, and Grayson, the Pundit, who we also renamed as Dollar Tree last week. So Grayson is like racking up the nicknames. Uh, <laughs> and today, what I want everybody to do is tell us uh, your name and then what's your favorite cigar and what's your favorite spirit besides the Holy Spirit? We know the Holy Spirit is number one. All right. So we don't need anybody to go mystic on us, Myron. We want you to tell us. <laughs> we want you to uh, tell us. Because <laughs> I like the Holy Ghost. <laughs> we all like the Holy Ghost. That's why we're here. Okay. True to that. All right. True to that. So I'm going to start off. As I said, I'm Christian the Heretic. And my favorite cigar, I've been thinking about this for a couple of days now, but the Fat Bottom Betty has become my favorite. Like, I have some really close second place cigars to that, like the uh, Andalusian Bull by LFD, the Placencia Almaforte by Rocky Patel, but the Fat Bottom Betty just does it for me. And then my favorite libation, I've gotten into bourbon. Shout out to my friends in the Black Bourbon Society group on Facebook. They have put me on so much stuff that I never knew about until like three months ago. So I've gotten heavy into bourbons. And my favorite bourbon right now is called Blade and Bow. Blade and Bow. It's my favorite pour. Uh, I, can, I can mix pretty much any bourbon. But when it comes to just sipping, whether I'm sipping it neat or doing it on the rocks, Blade and Bow is my, my go-to. But for today, I'm doing my Cafe Royale, and I got my uncle here, Uncle Nears, in my Cafe Royale. So that's what I got. Next, let me get Tiger. 
and then Nikki, Myron, who else we got here? Karima, and then Kingmaker. Tiger, Hello. Nikki, Myron, Karima, Kingmaker. Let's go. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tiger Gibson. Uh, today, oh, well, I'm Tiger Gibson. Glad to be here amongst these incredible people. My favorite cigar is the Opulence 3. Um, and I have two close. I was introduced to the Fat Bottom Betty by these wonderful individuals. And then uh, my favorite spirit would be, um, I would say, Gentleman Jack. And uh, Parsons proof, but we'll have to go into that a different way. Um, today, I am having coffee that my wife has made um, with Snickers creamer. You, if you Snickers the candy bar creamer yes. and Parsons proof, and it is amazing. Um, Oh, and my third pick, because can I give one more cigar? Is that okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Is that all right? You got time? You got, you got time. the hand going too. You, you said he's a, he did the Myron. Is that all right? Do I have more time? Is that all right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's the Opulence 3, number one, the Fat Bottom Betty, and then there's one called the Tabac Especial. And uh, those three are my favorite. So tobacco specials will be my third and those are my faves and spirit wise, uh Gentleman Jack and Parsons Proof. But I have to we'll get into Parsons Proof later on within the series. So y'all get ready for an incredible episode. Hey all I'm Nikki Hardiman. I'm so glad to be with you all today. Uh, so I don't know if I've been smoking long enough to really claim a favorite cigar, uh, but I'm of the ones that I have smoked, I have probably enjoyed most the Fat Bottom Betty. There's the that sweetness that's with it. Y'all turned me on to it. It's exceptional. I enjoyed smoking it. Um, looked for it for today. Couldn't find it. Um, and my favorite spirit... Uh, Probably my go-to is Bullet out of Kentucky, Bullet Bourbon. Um, I'll drink it neat on the rocks. I'm drinking it today in a Kentucky Mule with a little ginger ale and lime. Nice. Mm. Myron? Hey, folks. How y'all doing? I'm coming to you live from Hampton, Georgia, sitting in suburbia. Uh, I'm excited to be with you all for I, what I know is going to be a really exciting episode. So my favorite spirit... Um, is Douce. And I like Douce because it's versatile, right? You can sip it in high society or if you are having a night full of revelry uh, with people of all types of class and income, you can have some Douce and everybody appreciates it. Everybody. My favorite cigar is, you know, just like these folks, I love the Fat Bottom Betty. I buy them by the box. Uh, and it's a wonderful cigar. Now, this morning, I'm smoking something a little different. This was given to me. It's a Gurkha uh, Eval. Uh, it's, it's evil, but I didn't want to call it an evil. It's Eval. It's a Gurkha Eval. And I'm trying that out today. Uh, so I'm excited to be with you all. <laughs> so did what Myron just did, he just, that was his way of doing the signature. Yes. Okay. Evolve. So Evolve. we're not gonna we won't be letting you slide on that either, buddy. <laughs> Evolve. Let me right. you let me slide, I get you a fat bottom, Betty. Uh -huh. The <laughs> devil is E oh okay. Never heard it. <laughs> there you go. Karima Akila. Hello, 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 and hello again. That is my name. That's what they call me. That's what I answer to most times. My name is Karima Akila, and today I am drinking um, some Cafe Du Monde. But when it is a little later in the day, um, you know, my good, good boyfriend, of course, is the, the always faithful Uncle Nearest. However, you know, it's summertime, and when I need to pull off some stuff, 
I got to drink something that rhymes with that my name, Akila. Then I got to go to some tequila. Because when I got to pull off some crazy shit, that's when I need to drink some tequila. And, you know, I feel like I need to pull some things off. So that means, you know, I'm going to get me a little reposado. So that would be my, those are my two favorite spirits right there. And I'm not really a, that much of a smoker, but you get enough Uncle Nearest in me, and then, you know, all things are possible. <laughs> so, see y'all again today. I can't wait for this conversation. Yeah, let's get it. <laughs> Yo, Kareem, you be killing me. I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm just trying to keep it 100. You see, trying to keep it 100. I love it. I love it. Yo, when you first said, I got to pull some stuff off, I was like, what is no, she pulling it off? It and sure. where is she I pulling it off? Hey. The people on Patreon, they was doing stuff like this. <laughs> Yo, that's hilarious. All right, Kingmaker. Uh, greetings, everybody. I am uh, Curvance Ross, the Kingmaker. And um, my favorite cigar, hands down, is the Ashton ESG in the 22-year-old rapper. Uh, it's a classic. Um, I just love it. And when I want to have a celebration, uh, that's my that's my stick to go to. Um, my favorite right now um, is Uncle Nearest. Um, I have become a huge fan of Uncle Nearest, but my always go to uh, right now is Hennessy Black. We just had this conversation. Uh, and that's my regular go-to. So always honored to be with these uh, scholars and um, Daddy Grace. And I'm just uh, grateful. <laughs> why do you Why do you always call me that? That is so unnecessary. Uh, but it not wouldn't be an episode if we did that. <laughs> um, so tell us when you say Hennessy Black, you're including. <laughs> The, the reality that you've also had Hennessy white and you still choose the black over the white? Yes. Um, it's, it's hot because, of course, you know you can't get it in the States. Um, but after drinking all of the Hennessy outside of uh, um, the most <laughs> expensive version of it, I've had all the rest of them. Um, Hennessy Black is just consistent. I think it's the best one that they've made. So yeah, I, on top of white, um, because Black Lives Matter, um, I am making sure that uh, Hennessy, <laughs> Hennessy Black. <laughs> well, we starting off wild, aren't we? Are we, just are we here? <laughs> <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Can I say shout out to Uncle Nearest? Shout out to Uncle Nearest. They interact with us so much on Instagram. Yeah. We love you, Uncle Nearest. Oh, yeah. They you love should sponsor us. us. You Uncle should sponsor Nearest, us. Send you us each are line. the greatest. I, we love you. Nearest, oh, not hard to be. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. We, we're, so Uncle Nearest is a great uh, bourbon, um, but, but for me, it's the story behind it that really yeah. draws me to it. It just, it, it connects with me emotionally, understanding the history behind it. So that's, you know, just, it's an incredible way um, <clears throat> to launch a brand. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm a huge fan of it as well. So shout out to Uncle Nearest. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to send a special shout out to one of our top fans, Ariana Venezuela. Yeah. Ariana Ariana Venezuela has been rocking with us since day one. She supports us. She comments. She likes. She shares. She gives us ideas on how we can share it. So, shout out to Ariana Venezuela. Um, she's she's brilliant as well, and just a huge supporter of Holy Smokes. Uh, so much love to you. Nice so, love. let's talk about sex. The topic everybody cares about um everybody's thinking about it most of us are doing it 
but nobody wants to have the spiritually based conversation. Um, and I think it's important that we have these open and honest conversations mm -hmm. about the topic because when we don't, it leads people to do so much stuff in secrecy that becomes harmful. Or if we just talk about it and open, we could actually put in place some healthy ways to navigate the topic, especially when we're dealing with young people, so on and so forth. So that's why I want to get into it. And let me also say again, we have fun here. We're smoking cigars. We're drinking bourbon. Holy Smokes does not encourage overindulgence. Never encourage overindulgence. Every now and then, Myron might have one sip too much. Every now and I then. I don't drive afterwards. I don't drive. I just sit where I am. I just stay there. <laughs> Every now and then, Karima may get the rest of Sato, and then she's, you know, pulling stuff hey. off. But still. <laughs> still we don't encourage overindulgence here we're very serious about that but we do encourage balance uh so we're not the only preachers and uh people of faith that smoke cigars we just are open and honest about it rather than doing it in the shadows much like this topic of sex <laughs> where everybody claims to be holy whatever their version of holy is Everybody's claiming to be abstinent, whatever their version of abstinence is. But we've been in church long enough, all of us. We know folk out there doing it. So let's talk about it since we're doing it. Y'all, so why did our producer Kirkland just say, yeah, that's me? Like he over <laughs> here practicing abstinence. Kirkland, you are silenced, sir. Do not lie. <laughs> I thought he was saying so that's me because he was doing it in the shadows. <laughs> I thought I thought that's why he said that to me. My mistake. Good one. <laughs> well, it's time to come out of the shadows then. Oh boy. Um, you know what? I have a suggestion on this podcast. We might have to create a dollar jar for every time a shot is fired. We might be able to give more money to charity that way. That's a five dollar jar. Oh, yeah, we go yeah. Broke. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we might need broke. that. <laughs> Tiger, you, you have... gonna be broke, especially. <laughs> it's your idea now. <laughs> yeah, Tiger and Myron gonna be broke. <clears throat> I've changed my ways. Two nights. No, ago. no, sir. <laughs> Don't lie. Don't lie. All right. So here, here's the question I want to throw out on this topic of let's talk about sex. And we're gonna work through this topic a little bit. I wanna start out with Tiger and then let's go from there. Tiger, I want you to tell us what did you learn growing up about sex from your church and how was that reinforced in your home? Go ahead, bro. So <laughs> Say it again. I I don't know what happened. My, um, oh, say, it, repeat it one more time. What did What did you learn growing up about sex from your church, and how was it reinforced in your home, or contradicted in your home? Okay, so growing up, growing up in my church, what I learned about sex was be abstinent, be abstinent, be abstinent be abstinent and that was it there, right there, there wasn't too much of a blueprint there wasn't too much of a um support system <clears throat> uh but we had this group of <clears throat> people who we looked up to who ap appeared and who i believe had themselves together but that was just pretty much it hey be abstinent. All right, go. <laughs> Next kid, come here. Be abstinent. All right, now go on out into the world. Come here. You, you there. Be abstinent. All right, go on out. And so then you go out into this world that, or into your neighborhoods where the conversation is, yo, I can't wait to have sex. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? 
And um, the only weapon that I was armed with was be abstinent. So my emotions on the inside is, yo, we got to go get us some. Can't wait. And what I'm armed with is be abstinent. So that's essentially what I was prepared with. Um, my mom took more, my mom and dad took more of a pragmatic approach. My dad gave us a 15 minute speech, a uh, 15 second speech about sex to me and my brother. Son, come here. Sons, come here. Let me tell you about it. In my day, sleep with a woman, you catch something, it was okay. We laughed about it. Now you do it, you die. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> yeah. All right, boys. Go on out there. <laughs> you know, that was it. He talked to us like we was about to hit the field. <laughs> Let's go, boys. <laughs> <laughs> that was literally my sex speech. And then... <laughs> He called me back in the locker room like I was the captain. Now, Tiger, you probably you probably going to play a little bit more than your brother. <laughs> uh, you going to get a little more playing time than your brothers. I want you to be extra safe. We going to need you for the whole game. <laughs> I, and, and so now here I am, kid. Everybody is having sex. You got, and think of the dispensation of time. We got two live crew. Mm. Ooh, two live crew. Oh, God. Right? We got, we got um, the Spice Channel. Yep. And on my block, you could see the Spice Channel through the squiggly line. I mean, my block, too. And I was on the other side of the country. Yeah. So that was, and that was my introduction to pornography. So mm -hmm. first I got A, stay, uh, be abstinent. My, 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 my mom is saying, hey, watch out for these girls. That's all I got from her. My dad yes. calls us in like we are about to go on the football field. And he said, in my day, we had catch something from women. We laughed about it, take a shot, we back out. That was it. So as far <laughs> as the church, though, um, it was a dusting of it. <clears throat> yeah. When, when I first looked at the question, and I, I shared this with my wife, um, the first thing my mind shifted to when I thought about sex was, I wish we were more candid about the subject matter. Um, say sex from the pulpit. Say it in your small groups. Say it. It's okay. Right. It's a biblical thing. And I think we should say it in layers. First layer. Say it from a pragmatic thing, a logical piece. It's a physical thing, right? It's a logical, physical thing that our minds are going to think about because sex is everywhere. Then right. spiritual piece. Let's talk about soul ties. Let's not just say be abstinent, be abstinent, be abstinent, but let's talk about what happened. And then let's integrate this piece married people I, I i said this uh to a group of married people one day i'm married now i get one vagina <laughs> <laughs> one vagina for the rest of my life i need to be in it single people I don't need to be in the vaginas yet. <laughs> right? So let's get the married people in the vaginas humping. Right? Let's get more of that moving. Because it's crazy. No. To be... Okay, I'm sorry. I thought this was holy smokes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yo. This is the, this is the pottery. 
You know what I'm saying? <laughs> think, no, I feel you. Think about no, that you. for a minute. Because yo, we got married, we got married people with like 20 side chicks. True. Right? Mm. Well, let's with say, you. let's say side pieces. Side pieces. Let's say right. side pieces, because you know right. it's real you don't easy. Know what's to on just, the side. It's real yeah. easy to say, you know, only men have a side piece, but right. women have side pieces too. And then uh, some saw. men, some men have male side pieces. You not That's lying? Not, yeah, this DL lying. situation. You not lying? Because I saw a lady in Publix with her side piece, got the groceries, and got in the car with whoever it was supposed to be. And when I saw them, <laughs> when I saw the minivan, I just said, "All right, sister, I see what you're doing." <laughs> so I think the subject matter should be. Oh spoken and I think people should be armed pragmatically and spiritually. Yeah. And we can be better people overall. And we can have right. better families and our children will be better. Right. When it's time to talk to my daughter about it, I'm giving her the real deal. My right. wife is my wife is prepared to give Kayla the real deal. And she'll be able to think the right way. And that's what I learned at church. Tiger, exactly. That's a great point you brought up. Like when churches are only teaching abstinence, it's like we leave so much up to chance without equipping anybody to move forward. Like I, I saw this article, it was a survey where this, this group, I don't remember the name of the group that did the research, I do remember when I read it, it came from a credible source, but they, they polled Christians on their um, sexual training or ethic in their church. And most of them said that they were taught abstinence. Of the people who said they were taught abstinence, 80% of them admitted they did not stay abstinent until they got married. 80% admitted that means, according to this survey, exclusively teaching abstinence at best has a 20% success rate. Mm -hmm. If that's the only ethic that you teach at best, based on the people that admitted you have a 20% success rate in every field I've been in, in every school I've been in, in every sport that I played, 20% is a huge F which means we've been teaching something that has been failing generations. So I think that's something that we need to really start thinking about. And I'm glad you brought that up. Anybody else, what did you learn in church? How was it reinforced at home? Well, um, in my church that I grew up in, the pulpit had an angle that sex was a gift that God gave to a man and a woman under the confines of marriage to be able to express that they loved each other without putting it in words. Um, so the message was conveyed that this was only to be used in the confines of holy matrimony. Um, that kind of conflicted seeing that I grew up, uh, shout out to one of my favorite brands, Hood and Holy, literally Hood and Holy. Um, and it didn't match uh, what I learned on the street. It didn't match uh, how my mom had the conversation with me and it didn't match how uh, even the fact that I grew up in a church that was had a lot of men that predominantly the deacons. We had like 70 deacons when I grew up. And most of those guys used to be some form of hustler, uh, be some form of uh, former street guy. They were just amazingly cool. Um, and I had conversations with them because I was the young guy hanging with the old guys. And knowing that that wasn't the case, um, understanding that a lot of them had extramarital affairs. Um, both 
not just the men. I'm not making negative of the men, but women as well. Um, and understanding church early in a way that I would probably say most young people or parishioners should not have learned it. Um, it just didn't match what was said in the pulpit to what was actually going on in the pews. So that was what I learned uh, in church growing up. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 70 deacons. That's a lot, Reverend. That's a lot of deacons. Yeah, man. You get up any Sunday morning for devotion, and from the left side of the pulpit up the side aisle, all the way to the exact other side, all the way up the side aisle, it was it was a men men were involved in everything at our church. So, and the deacons were the most prominent space to see men. So I saw them of all ages, uh, all backgrounds, um, and they co-signed on it. Um, simply because that was the way the church was done. You say what you say in church, before and after church is a totally different ball game. <laughs> now that's something that we can really jump on, but I want to keep it moving. I want one of the ladies to jump in because clearly um, many of us have noticed that the lessons about sex are generally different in how we teach the boys and how we teach the girls. So I really want to let one of the ladies jump in and tell us what messages you got in your church and how it was reinforced in your home? Well, real quick, it was don't get pregnant. Don't do mm. it because you can get pregnant. And don't get pregnant. Uh, it was don't let anybody touch you. Um, and it was you know, the language, the words that were used, right? Um, grew up in a traditionally Black Baptist church. And there was no no other teaching, no other explanation. I did not hear, maybe I heard, well, definitely you heard sex was for marriage, um, but no other type of conversation. Don't get pregnant. Don't do it. And then it's don't get pregnant. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Nikki? Uh, yeah, so much like y'all, I was taught abstinence. Many of you, I was taught abstinence. I went through the True Love Waits program. Me too. Um, yep, yep. I got the ring. I signed the card. Um, and base, and so if anybody doesn't know what that is, it was a, a program designed for evangelical churches uh, to teach abstinence to their youth groups. Uh, and I will say that as I've grown up learning what, how other people have experienced that program, mine was relatively moderate in that um, it wasn't, it wasn't harmful in the sense of, um, it didn't go as far as a lot of that purity culture went. Um, so I didn't get that kind of background that my father is gonna have to give me away uh, and, and that, you know, my dad didn't give me my ring. I picked my own ring, right? So it didn't have those same kind of negative connotations, but the subtleties were there. Uh, and so you got it kind of subtly. And, and definitely for women, there was an emphasis on um, don't get pregnant. Uh, it, and there was also a you can get sick and die if you have sex, but somehow that automatically changes when you say I do, and all of a sudden this thing that has been completely evil is supposed to be a wonderful gift that you're supposed to know how to do and enjoy um, right away without question. And that's um, something. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's like apparently when you say I do, a switch flips. And all of a sudden, this thing mm. that was evil and awful and to be avoided at all costs is something you're supposed to want all the time without question, regardless of how that relationship is and regardless of what you know to do with it. So, um, and I'll say, um, are we answering about home here too? Are we supposed to talk about how home enforced are we? Yeah, how is how's it reinforced in your home? Or, so I think, you know, my family, on the whole, my parents gave me a relatively healthy sexual ethic within those bounds. I don't know, does that make sense? So they gave me some tools with how to make good decisions. They acknowledged, um, we, Tiger, I have to say in your opening, 
I was so glad you said the word vagina um, because like using the right words for the body parts is so important. <laughs> Um, and I, it really, I mean, it's, it's a really important thing. And, and my family gave me that gift, right? They taught me the right words. They taught me, um, real biology, um, and, and those kinds of things. So they gave me a fairly healthy way to look at it, but it was still in these bounds of it's bad before marriage. It's really wonderful afterwards. You so know what? You just wrote. Go ahead. What's the right word now, Nikki? Vagina. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, all right. So there you just reminded me. There are other words. Me. There are other words, but we don't have to name them all right now. I imagine they'll get said along the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the what you just what you just said reminded me of how culture conditions us to the point that when we hear these biological terms, it makes us uneasy and unsettled. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I was a, when I was a kid, you know, there was this movie that came out called Kindergarten Cop with Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I believe this line was in that movie. This little kid says, boys have a penis, girls have a vagina. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And he's just stating a scientific truth. Right, right. But culturally that's so taboo mm -hmm. it it jarred me as a kid to where now i'm 36 and i still remember it like it was yesterday mm -hmm. but because of how taboo and how stigmatized sex is in our culture and i want to say one more thing and then i want to hear what the mystic has to say um somebody asked earlier in the comments what is the spice channel so if you don't know what the Spice Channel is, this is back before we had streaming, uh, and you know, you could, it's, it's similar to the Playboy Channel, but it's like a step up in soft porn. So, of course, now you can go online and watch porn, you know, all day with no questions asked. But back in the day when we were kids, if we wanted to try to, you know, sneak a little porn in and we didn't have, we didn't live in a household where we had a subscription to those channels. They had the distorted screen. <laughs> so you had to actually like purchase the Spice Channel. But if you didn't purchase it, you could like watch through the distorted screen and the squiggly lines and get your little your little sneak peek. <laughs> Am I, did I do that justice? Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, I I uh I instant message Nikki. Uh and that was actually the exact definition mm -hmm. I gave for. <laughs> um so you're right on. Um Side note, the we had a station, WATL, uh, channel 36 here in Atlanta. And after like nine, it kind of got HBO-ish. Mm. And they had a, a, a movie that I tried to sneak and watch. It was called Private Lessons. Oh, and wow. Private Lessons was this little teenage boy who, by his teacher who was really like a really seductress uh white woman and he was a white kid she gave him tutorial uh private lessons on sex and it was just blowing me away so i would always anytime it came on it was like the soft porn that a little kid needed to just be like oh okay this is what it's all about so my image of of women sexually they had to have on the little gray mini skirt the white button up <laughs> shirt you know the pumps the, because that's private lessons that's what he was inclined by and those were all the images that we saw so my image of being in tune with someone that was sexy she had to have long blonde hair she had to have the white button up shirt the mini skirt and the black pumps so all of those images and then going into church, it all collided. Uh, yeah. And it, but it, none of it, to be honest with you, the church version was muted by the world and life version. So you heard it, but based off of your culture and where you grew up, sometimes you didn't hear it. 
Yeah, and that's a challenge, right? If we don't have honest conversations about sex in our churches and with our kids, they will get the training from somewhere. Yeah. They're either going to watch porn, they're going to talk to their peers who don't know anything either, because, you know, you always got that one. I feel like if I would have known Kurt Vance as a kid, huh? I feel like Kurt Vance would have been that kid who would have talked about sex like he's been having it since he was seven. <laughs> So <laughs> like, that, oh yeah, you know, do, you know, I was over a, in the. Does he get the five dollar oh. jar now? Because that was shock. Yeah. All right, unnecessary. <laughs> but am I lying though? Am I lying? Am I lying? So, Think about the me, kids. Let me let me tell you. And this is about this my signature move. It took me a minute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes! Yes! Y'all gonna laugh at that? Is that okay? Hey, yo, me and Myra got five dollars both. Okay, I got you. Uh That's the ten piece. I was just adding on. I was just adding on. Oh my god! Let let me tell you one of the main challenges I had, and it took me a while to get over because I always hung with older guys. (laughs) In the third grade, uh, we had a dude that had. I'm I'm gonna date myself. Hustler magazines and skank magazines out he would get them out of his his uh dad's room. His dad had them up under the mattress. And what he would do is come in and when we would go for reset recess or after school, he'd take pages out and pass them out to us. So the first page I got was uh, a, a a white woman. Uh, urinate uh, in skank. And when you talk to the old guys, they always told you that you got to make sure that you you deep enough. Why? Because there's this hole, and if you, you're not deep enough, you're going to drown. What? Because, what because if, it, if, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, she's going to drown you. What? So, so get this. this. Next level. I couldn't swim. I, I, I couldn't swim. swim. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, oh. one of my recurring fear dreams is that when I had sex, I, I was going to try. <laughs> <laughs> oh my so, god, this is next level here. Oh, oh god. To play into oh what you're saying, you oh gotta god. really have that honest conversation because when I first saw one, I was expecting it to be like this abyss. <laughs> <laughs> and when I saw it, I was like, that doesn't look like what they had explained because in my young head, it was going to be this huge hole. And if, if I wasn't deep enough, I was going to drown. Oh, I, my God. I had a seminary professor who said, children are excellent observers and terrible interpreters. And this is the perfect example, because kids yep. will listen to everything that is said, but they don't always have all the knowledge to interpret what they hear correctly. And they I'm can only you, Nikki, connect it to what they know. Nikki, when she went, when the first girl showed me one, I was eating Wonder Bread. Like, that's not it. Yeah. Oh, that's God. Not it. Yo, I'm laughing so hard. I'm sweating right now. Like, for real. Myron, okay, you from New Orleans, man. You, you got to tell us what, what did you learn growing up? My God, I don't know how you follow that. That's, that's wild there, brother. That is wild. I just want to say thank God I can swim. Uh, but here we go. <laughs> I don't know about you, um, but I do want I do want to say I'm gonna answer the question, but I do want to say uh, I stayed away from the Spice Channel because our remote control had the recall button, so if you pressed it, it would go back to the last channel you watched, and it would be obvious that I was the one watching the Spice Channel. So I stayed away from that. But let me tell you what my John was. John is a Philly word for meaning thing. I got that from a young lady from Philly. There was no sex involved. Um, let me tell you, BET at 2 a.m. have the uncut. BET. Let me, let me tell you why that worked for me. Because after uncut went over, it was about an hour. 
right at 3 a.m., Peter Popoff came on. Mm -hmm. So it went from uncut to televangelism. And I can always say I was watching Peter Popoff. <laughs> but something was popping off and it wasn't Peter. Uh, <laughs> wasn't Peter at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I'm going to answer oh the question, God. Terrell. Are you, you, you going to answer the question? I am. I'm going to answer the question. Answer the question. <laughs> hey, he about, to, I was, he, about to be, <laughs> he about to be over here with me, Kirk. <laughs> so, listen, oh, this is God. what I was... This, this is what I was... This was taught and caught. So we didn't talk about it much. And when we did talk about it, it was this idea of abstinence, just like everybody else. We were victims to this church Western idea of what sex is and what sex was. It was abstinence, abstinence, abstinence. You know, yes for marriage, but no for any and everybody else. So that was what we were taught. And I, uh, that's dangerous. That was dangerous because you remember we had this discussion a couple episodes ago when we talked about race relations, uh, that we need to constantly have the conversation because people are constantly changing and moving in their lives. We need to constantly have the conversation about what sex is and what sex means. One of my alumni brothers, and he's deceased now, Miles Monroe used to say, if you don't know the purpose of a thing, you'll abuse it. And so a lot yeah. of people were abusing sex because we never talked about the purpose of it. And we never had the discussion about the purpose of it. And so it was meant and out there for abuse. So that's what I was taught. Bro, you just said a mouthful right there. If we don't mm -hmm. know the purpose of it, we will abuse it. Yes, Miles Monroe, God rest his precious soul. Um, yeah, so I'll just say, I'll say real quick, um, my lessons were the same as you all. Uh, abstinence, don't have sex, wait till you're married. <clears throat> Which um, <clears throat> shaped me in many ways. Now the funny thing is, like, my dad would talk about sex in my presence, but not directly. So we literally didn't have a sex talk till I was in my third year of college. That was like the first time my dad and I had a real sex talk. I know there was one time prior to that where, um, you know, I grew up in the age where the internet <clears throat> became a, a thing like it, it became um common it, everybody had you know I, I grew up in the AOL age where you had to wait for it to load and all of that stuff so when I discovered porn online I would watch porn online but I was watching it on my dad's computer so one time I forgot <laughs> to close the window down and my dad went into his office to do his sermon prep that's rookie and, uh, mistakes there. Rookie mistakes, man. Yeah, it was a rookie mistake. I acknowledge it. I've grown. And he saw what I had up on the screen. And uh, he called me down. He said, Bubba? And, uh, you know, he always called me Bubba. So I didn't think anything of it. I come downstairs and I'm like, yeah. And he said, what's this? And I look on the screen. I'm not even going to tell you what was on the screen. Let me just say it was a bit much. And uh, it wasn't anything uh, abusive, let me say that. Now, it wasn't like anything where anybody was being harmed. Everybody was having a good time. Um, but he said, now, Bubba, this is, uh, this is some hardcore stuff right here. Uh, he said, you know, oh, you shouldn't be watching this. So that was, that was it, right? We didn't go any further than that. Then we were riding from... Texas to California in my truck, like my third year of college. I, I went to Alabama a and University. But I, I live, Curvass Ross, a and all day. Uh, shout out to the Bulldogs. So I would drive home for the summer. Say something, Ross. What you going to say? 1875. William yes, sir. Council. Yes, Council Brave. So <laughs> we were, <clears throat> I would drive back to California from Alabama. This particular year, wow, I, yeah, I did the first leg to Texas by myself, and I met my dad, who was preaching in Houston. And after he got done preaching, we hopped in the truck together and drove the rest of the way together. One of the, the best experiences of my life. I absolutely love my dad. God rest his soul. That was the first time we had a real conversation about sex, where he really gave it to me straight. The funny thing is, my dad's way of telling me how to be sexually proficient 
was using a sermon analogy. <laughs> My dad was a preacher. He said, son, let me tell you how this thing goes, all right? Sex is just like a good sermon. He said, when you're preaching, the idea is, is you start off slow. You don't rush into it. You got to start off slow. You have too many preachers that just want to immediately start yelling at you from the pulpit. No, you got you to gotta ease people into the message. Don't, Reverend. So you, so you start off slow. All right. And then you build up slowly and you get people to a climax and you let them come back down. You get them to a climax and let them come back down. Now, when they climax, you don't climax yet because you got a plan in mind. But you're taking them on this roller coaster, let them climax and bring them back down and take them back up and bring them back down and then take them back up and bring them back down. And then at the end, we all celebrate and climax end, together. <laughs> That's a word. That's a word. Leaning, <laughs> leaning <laughs> your chair, Reverend. Say it with your chest, Reverend. Yes, Lord. Leaning <laughs> your chair, Reverend. Listen, your dad was a preacher's preacher. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was the conversation. What were you saying, Karima? That'll get you saved and delivered right there. <laughs> Up. <laughs> That's a good That's news for sure. Do, to, and, uh, in the words of one of my favorite side preachers, talk into the mic, Reverend. Talk into the <laughs> mic. <laughs> yeah. So that's what he taught me. But I didn't get that message till I was like 20 years old. So I had from the age of like seven or eight till 20 before I had a real, like, you know, uh, raw conversation about sex with my dad which left a lot of room in between there for me to mess up a lot and get the wrong messages. So I want to like keep moving this forward to ask the question of the stuff you got when you were a kid in your church and your home as you were growing up, what messages did you retain into adulthood that you saw as valuable? And then what did you discard? So one of the things that I learned from some old players um was whenever a woman gives you what is her greatest gift her sex always return it better than you got it um you don't drop off nothing that she didn't uh deliver to you and you don't mess up what she gave you uh you make it better than you left it so I learned to always never just think about myself. Um, it was about a mutual satisfaction. On top of that, it made me very cognizant of um, being safe, uh, not getting anybody pregnant, and making sure that I protected myself because they told me, you only get one penis. Uh, you can't trade it off. So you got to protect it. You got to value your life. And if you value you, you will value her. Uh, so I went through that, never wanting to disappoint my grandmother, my great grandmother, or my mom. Um, and a lot of it was God's grace. Um, and I didn't want to have a bad reputation because growing up around street guys and hustlers, they had the conversation that if uh, multiple women had a conversation about you. They should all have something positive to say. Uh, they should not all know that they're talking about the same person. And they should never leave any trash on your name because you trash them. Um, so it forced me to look at this as a valuable interaction. The flip side to it was it never limited itself to just being marriage. Um, and that was impactful to me, simply because as I got older, I quickly learned that the template in the Bible had a different cultural age context to it. So when you're talking about not having sex until you got married, you know, the average age was 13 to 16. It's not a, it's not a lot of, holding back to wait till you're 16. 
uh, but our average age in America is 30, 35. So I learned that some of the images and inferences we had put in the Bible were not realistic when you transition them to different cultures and different time frames. And the major challenge that I had was most of the people who preached um, marriage-based sex only didn't live marriage-based sex only. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the people who talked about uh, had not having sex before marriage had had all kind of sex before marriage. And it became a problem because I think Nikki alluded to this earlier. They made you believe that if you stood before God in a ceremony that you had paid extortious amounts of money for <laughs> and in front of uh, a group of people that all of a sudden magically your desire to sleep with other people would just disappear. Uh, so they didn't prep you for the fact that to follow what they had argued required a utopia uh, that you were around people who had never done what they argued, that your circle was as pure as the process that they were giving you, and that everything around you had been bleached white so that it doesn't allow you to do that. But if your circle is, I mean, you gotta think from a male standpoint, they tell us to sow our wild oats. They tell you to play the field. Well, if everybody around you is playing the field, this is what you've cultivated. Your bachelor party is as uh, contradictory to your wedding ceremony as possible. And then all of a sudden you gonna stand up and after all of 18 to 29 years of doing whatever you wanted to do, now you're going to magically lose all of those desires. None of that meshed with me. So the value of it that I took away was to always respect this component of power and gift that women had. Never dog it, never minimize it, and never leave it more contaminated than they brought it to me. And you know what's funny, man? <clears throat> what, what sticks out to me about what you're saying is the messages that you retained were not the messages you heard in Sunday school and youth group. Nope. The stuff you discarded was the stuff they told you in church. The stuff you yep. kept was the stuff they told you in private. And I And I think that's something we really need to think about. Also, to Nikki's point earlier, she talked about how <clears throat> we tell kids no sex is evil, it's bad, and all of a sudden when you get married, you're supposed to flip a switch. That is traumatic mm -hmm. for a lot of people. There are some people who are traumatized by sex when they get married because of what they have been taught in the church and in the home, so then they cannot function in their marital relationship, and it takes them a long time to adjust if they ever adjust. Okay, well, so I want to hear. Can I say this if you don't mind? Yeah. Uh, I shared this with you and I'll share this publicly. I had a friend, uh, associate rather, who they grew up in church and um, his wife was a virgin because that's what they taught in church. Um, come to find out that when they got married, he was a virgin. Um, but he was well endowed. And when they had their first intimate encounter, because she had never had sex, and he's so excited to have sex, it was so painful and traumatic for her that she didn't want to have sex anymore throughout their marriage. Um, mm -hmm. And he comes back to us as guys, as grown men, and is having to ask the question, what do I do? I've waited all this time. My wife hates it. I don't want to cheat on her, but she has been made miserable by, miserable by this encounter and she's traumatized. Guys, do I divorce my wife? What do I do? And this was a dynamic that was cultivated in church. And he's done it the quote, quote, right way. And now he's waited all this time and his wife don't even want to have sex. So it created a whole different dilemma 
that we didn't even know how to have a conversation around. Yeah. Yeah. Karima, I want to hear what you have to say. What did, what did you keep? What did you discard? Or do you want to add any commentary on what Kermance just said? Wow. All right. <laughs> Uh-oh. Everybody buckle up. So, so, so check this. So um, what, what Kermance just said about, you know, the, the wife was a virgin when she got married. So you do what the church says. Um, and most churches only teach the abstinence, as we all share. Most churches and families do not teach the joys and the pleasures of sex. Most people don't teach their kids how to own your body and your sexuality. Know your body, touch yourself, learn how to please and value yourself. You are a sexual person and that needs to be acknowledged when, before you get married. So in that instance, um, that's where my story differs from her. Um, while the church was preaching abstinence, what was happening in my own personal life as a young girl, I was molested. And so mm. at the hands of an older female cousin. So that's all kinds mm. of crazy shit going through my mind, right? But what that did was it uh, awakened, you know, uh, sexual desire in me at a very young age. And so, um, you know, it was what I had to discard was everything that I heard in church, because as everyone just said, it didn't match or mesh what I was experiencing in real life. Um, so, you know, we had our experiences, but then this wonderful thing called marriage happens, right? And so now the, the only advice from the church at that time that I took with me was when they said, your husband wants an angel in the streets and a freak in the sheets. I said, oh, I can do that. I said, oh, okay, this is my shit. Y'all should have said that from the jump. Sure, I got you, right? That wasn't a problem. So, you know, I was like, okay, bet. <laughs> that's, what you, that's what you want. <laughs> that's what we doing. <laughs> that's why I got six kids, hey, amen. Okay. Six kids. Ain't, ain't a problem. You know what I mean? So, you know, I completely had to discard everything that I learned in church, number one. I only took, I only kept the parts that matched my personal experience. And number three, the part that I think was lacking the most is teaching people that we are sexual beings and that we should own it and that you should you should experience that. Like we don't talk about masturbation. We don't talk about, um, I mean, okay, so I'm a woman, right? I have a vagina, right? There are things that happen in that vagina every month that, you know, require me to go up in that, John, you know what I'm saying, and handle some things. <laughs> no one teaches you, you know, from the church or, or even from my family, that that's even okay and all right even to do that. You know, Nikki, I'm going I'm to just, you know, sit a little sister girl talk for a second. Mm -hmm. You remember, remember back in the day, in the 80s, we had a little commercial, OB, that's the way you should be, keep uh -huh. it simple, right? And so yes, yes. Yeah, no, no, no. Because see, that, them, they lied. They lied. They about lied. That. You know what I'm saying? Yes. That doesn't come with no applicator. <laughs> you know I mean? Right. You, all right. And, and your okay, fingers, now. Come on. And your fingers <laughs> yes. were the applicator. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm supposed to set myself free, but I got to go up in there myself. But I thought I was told not to touch my own. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But now he said set myself free. So it was all kinds <laughs> of contradictions. Oh, yes. God. So we had, yeah, okay. Come yeah, on we, now. Just come on, okay? This, this yes. is the other side of the dynamic, all right? All right. It is. It is. So yeah, I had to let everything go that I learned at the church. And it was a it was an extremely <laughs> awkward and contradictory <laughs> childhood because you know, here I am, this extremely sexually awake child. Now, of mm -hmm. course, abuse is abuse. It should never happen. Um, but we cannot ignore the statistics that so many people have experienced that and therefore their sexual nature is aroused at a place and beyond the point where it should be. And so someone else needed to have a different kind of conversation with me. And so, uh, yeah, 
I don't know what y'all gonna do with that, but that's that's what it is. I don't know what to do with that. Nikki, I'm gonna just pass it on to you. I had the sister talk. You you carry that on and then we're gonna toss it over to Tiger because we haven't heard from Tiger in a minute now. Uh, Kareem, I hear you. Um, and thank you thank you for sharing that because I think that's a really important part of this conversation. So often I think what we learn in church does lead to such distorted views of sexuality that people respond and when people's experiences are different because all humans have different ways of engaging their own sexuality, that it, it causes perversions to happen. Right. Um, it causes people to engage that sexuality in ways that are harmful and cause harm to other people. Um, and also, as you say, awakens people at a very young age to something that they don't yet have the capacity to, to understand um, and engage themselves. So, so I, so, but I do hear you this, I think this conversation, you're talking about something that I wanted to say about what I kept and what I let go. Um, what I let go of is that men are the ones who really love sex and women are the ones who let men enjoy it. Um, I'm just going to uh -oh. say women really enjoy sex. Hallelujah. Um, and, and I'm saying that from personal experience, but also from all of my girlfriends. Like, oh, I have very few girlfriends. I'm not even sure that I have a girlfriend who doesn't enjoy it. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't people who do because we are all different people. But by and large, women enjoy it just as much as men. And I think that the messages that we got growing up is that this was something men were unable to control in themselves. It was our responsibility to help them control themselves by the way that we acted and the way that we dressed, except mm. that culture told us to act and dress in a different way. Mm. Right? right? And so, so I dropped all of that. Um, women enjoy sex. And I think that when we can understand that about ourselves, it enables us then to be more empowered in making choices about what is good and healthy for our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our bodies. Um, mm -hmm. Right? So, I mean, because when we, and, and, and I think a part of that is it's, um, we have this idea that women give this gift to men. It is also a gift that men give to women. And um, when we choose to share that part of ourselves with another human being, um, we are sharing, um, it, is, it is an intimate experience. And, and I'm not going to make judgments on if this is a, if it's a one night stand or if it's somebody you've known forever or if it's somebody that you have, um, that you are married to. It is an intimate experience. And, and choosing to go into that place with another human being should always carry with it um, a sense of I'm not sure the right word, but it's something like holy. Yeah. Um, and so that is something that I kept. I do think that that encounter um, is meant to be intimate, relational. And for me, that is holy. I mean, yeah. so, that is, so that is a part of what I was raised with that I have held on to. I just understand it much differently than the way that I was taught. Mm -hmm. yeah mm. that that take on uh mutual exchange is something that is missed a lot but like you said um we teach that you know the boys are supposed to go out and get sex now we don't teach that in church in formal settings but that's the conversations that sure. we have individually right and then we teach the we teach the girls like you're not supposed to have sex until you get married and then it's your job to please the husband but we never teach the boys it's your job to please her which right. is why so many women have never had an orgasm like right. you have women who, because because boys are not taught you're supposed to make sure that she is satisfied i'm glad Kurt Vance got that message when he was younger but a lot of boys don't so they just go around trying to get their rocks off and you got a bunch of girls who are having sex who the reason they think they don't enjoy it is because they've never had a mutual exchange right and right. they've never taught themselves that they yes about what pleases themselves and that I is so important orgasm it's my job it's my that's right you know, that's it's, right it's, it's like it's my job to make me happy 
I make sure that I right. reach whatever climaxes need to happen. And we don't, if you don't know how you do that because you're never told that it's okay for you to even touch yourself, right. to touch your vagina, not your pocketbook like my grandmama called it. How do you even know, you know, what pleases you? Right. So then you can't yeah. tell him. That's right. Yeah. And I wanna, I wanna kick it over to Tiger and then Myron, but first I also wanna acknowledge that as we have this conversation, you know, Grayson isn't here. So you know if he was, he would bring in the Q plus perspective right. of how we don't even talk about sex as it pertains to people with same gender attraction. Mm -hmm. That's just evil from birth till death. You have no outlet to experience your sexuality in a church context when you, are, when you have same gender attraction. So that's a topic in and of itself that we could probably talk about for two weeks. I just want to acknowledge it right here right. of how poorly we as a church have done in that regard. But Tiger, what you got, man? What did you keep? What did you discard? What you got? I'm not sure how much I've discarded, but one thing I have kept was I remember when the men in my family found out I was sexually active, it was the same celebration I got from when I had a graduation or had a great basketball game or did some type of achievement. It was a good thing. But <clears throat> I remember I have a cousin that I grew up with who was like a sister. The day she, the family, found out she was active, uh, it was, it was bad. And I remember that day was the day I found out there's a difference. Um, a polarizing difference between men and women being sexually active in society. Um, and I, I felt, I felt bad and, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, your dad catches you, he walks away, that's my boy. Uh, your dad catches the daughter, his heart is broken. So that is something that I've always kept, is that double standard. And um, I know now we live in a different time and women are, um, taking their sexuality into their own hands and they are taking and moving forward with it, um, not letting society tell them how they should be. You know what I'm saying? Um, but that's something I remember being a young man that was, uh, I remember how I felt that day when the family came at my cousin. And I felt so bad for her, you know what I mean? Knowing I was praised uh, when I did the same thing, the double standard. And uh, I, I just remember that. So that's that's one thing that I kept. I, I can't really think too much on what I've thrown away. I think I keep everything. I think what you're what you're bringing up, Tiger, is that's an experience that you don't want to repeat in the lives of others. Mm -hmm. So you you kept it as a lesson, but you discarded it as something that you would practice in your life. Yeah, yeah. Am I yeah. am I saying that correctly? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I feel you. Yeah, it's, I'm it's not going to celebrate though. I'm not going to celebrate when Kayla do it, but. I ain't gonna crucify. I feel you. Yeah. <laughs> I feel you. There ain't gonna be no you got, steak man? dinner. <laughs> be what you got, Myron? Talk to us. He's a practicing lyricist. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, he's a young rapper. He's upcoming. He's upcoming. Check him out soon. I don't, I don't, I don't know his SoundCloud or nothing, but I, you know, he out there making beats now. And so I, I had to come inside. This conversation is too important for me to be distracted. Uh, so I came in. Uh, so I will tell you this. <sighs> that. Myra, you breaking so up a little bit, man. Out of you are. 
No. Can you hear me now? Yeah, Mari. Yeah, your um, I'm not your on internet it. is acting yeah, up. You got that um, you got that Teddy Riley internet, man. Come on. <laughs> I think somebody picked up the kitchen phone. <laughs> <laughs> Tell, tell whoever in your house to hang the phone yeah. up. My How we do? Are we good? We good? <laughs> we good? We good? Can you hear me now? Can you, can you hear me wait, now? Wait, wait, wait. Hold up a second. Before, before you continue, uh, Kirkland said somebody got $5. Who has $5, Kirkland? You talking about me? That was you for attacking my internet. Yeah, that was you. No, he said Tiger. He said Tiger. Both of y'all. Both of y'all. Oh, right. Wait, no, he took the shot. He, I mean, what? listen, you might have took the shot, Kirk. but uh, you were the rebound man, Christian. So <laughs> you, Dennis Rodman, Wait, down there. I... All, All right. right. Okay, let me. Let, I, I learned integration, is what I'm saying, folks. So we there was a separation. You know, you were spiritual in church, and then outside a church, you were human. I grew up in New Orleans, right? And I grew up in, going to a mega church in New Orleans. And so, in church, we would talk about spiritual and be spirit abstinence. But at the same time, we were in church. Let me tell you what was going on outside of church. I grew up in New Orleans. Cash money was big in New Orleans back in the 90s. Y'all remember Lil Wayne and, and Manny mm -hmm. Fresh and all of them? And their number one song was this song called Back That Ass Up. Y'all remember that? Oh, yeah. Very looking good. One. Myron. Back that ass yeah. up. You know what, yo? The church members in the video. What, you can't Myron, hear me? you got to get another AOL you can't hear me. Listen, I'm, am I going? Come back to me. I'm going I'm to log yeah, off and log we, back in. We're going to need, need for you to switch to your data or something because Comcast yeah. or at and is letting you down right now in this mm -hmm. Wi-Fi situation. Put so, a new AOL I'm going to log off and log back here. I'm going to log off. Come back to me. Come back to me. Come yeah. back to we are gonna come back to you. But hold up, Tiger, real quick. Before like, we come back to Myron after he gets his stuff worked out, when you said you're not going to celebrate your daughter when she does it, um, Kirkland asked the question, why? Tell us why oh, yeah. you're not going to celebrate Kayla. It's not about a celebration. It's her life. You know what I mean? It's um, if I had a son, I'm not gonna encourage it or whatever. It's their life. You know what yes. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's the thing. I don't. That's the problem. Go out there and get them. Um, it isn't. It's their life. My job is to prepare you to go out and do what you are supposed to do as a parent, and trust and govern, or trust that you can govern your life and go. My job isn't to crucify you when you make mistakes or whatever the case. And it's not me to judge you if I think the move you make is a mistake. So it's not about um, a celebration or whatever. It's her living her life. You see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. So it's not about a celebration. I mean, when the men in my family found out, it was that's, come here, come here, come here, come here. Tell them, tell them about it. Look at it. It was one of them, and do that. You know what I mean? So it's not even about a celebration, and it's not about mm -hmm. a nothing. It's just life. And, and the experience and it's going on. And I believe that we'll have a good enough of a relationship that she'll be prepared and it'll be what it is. Um, and and kinda, to kind of dovetail off that as the father of a daughter, we have to be honest that there are two different dynamics between men and women. Mm -hmm. um, and we can't act like they're even. Um, unfortunately, men don't have the same burden in that circumstance that women have. Um, mm -hmm. So to cheer her on societally, emotionally, and psychologically has a drastically different context to it. Um, because there are things that we as men 
don't really have to deal with that women do. Um, even when you break down the interaction in intimacy, we are often dropping off and they are actually carrying the baggage of all of our foolishness in the interaction. So certain things that I don't deal with as a male, women as females will have to deal with. And when you're cultivating that from a male voice to your daughter, your word is so important to your daughter that it could scar her, it could give her a different interpretation, it can di give her a different interaction. Again, you're not going to try to destroy her or lambast her, but you do want to help her understand that the roles are so different. And because that, that is not a dollar word, man. Lambaster. Lambaster. No, oh, yes. Yes, it is. The, yes, it is. The hell? Nikki, yes. come on. Come on, Nikki, can you help me? I need you to help me. No, not, I think this is a democratic situation. I think we got to go with a vote. <laughs> All right, so. Yo, Lambaster. Hey, I I'll put it to you like this. Since you call me Daddy Grace, I'm making a unilateral decision. Lambaster is the dollar word. You can continue. <laughs> so Lambaster is basically to pummel somebody through denigration or negative commentary. Um, and it's just not the right thing to do. So you got to find a happy medium when you're cultivating a daughter. That's differently right. than you have to when you are cultivating a son. Mm -hmm. I, either the, either the ladies want to add any commentary to that? What he just said? I, I will add, I, I think it's really important to name that there are different consequences physically and for men and women. Um, if the woman gets pregnant, she has to carry that baby or make a decision about what she's going to do in response to that. And the, the man is free to, he doesn't, he can choose to not carry that burden. He can also choose to walk with her while she carries it. Um, and so I do think that is important to help both our sons and our daughters understand the consequences of those actions. Um, what I, personally with my kids because I have a son and a daughter um I think Tiger I'm with you I'm not going to celebrate or denigrate when they choose to make their own decisions um, but I will celebrate with them if they feel like they have made a good choice and it has sure. been a good experience and I will sit with them if they feel like they've made a bad choice yeah. and help them walk through what those consequences are yeah. Um, yeah. and hopefully um and we you know and and respond responsibly to whatever they are yeah. so so celebrating the decisions but not the decision does that right. does that That's make perfect. sense nikki what you just said is essentially what my wife and i have uh agreed to we want to be the safety rails on right. the road and we're even going to allow you to hit the rail uh-huh mm. 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 we're yeah. gonna we're we're gonna allow That's you good. to yeah. hit the rail and the the one thing i appreciated from my dad um he was like yo i'm gonna let you hit the rail and even flip over and let's see if I catch you. Like he wanted me to be responsible enough not to go that far. Uh, he said, learn what I, use what I taught you. But that's the framework that Kay and I are gonna use with our, uh, with our child. And uh, we wanna be, we're not perfect parents, we're learning as we go. But we want to, as it comes to sex, drugs, this world is different than the world we grew up in. Like, yeah. guys, nobody on this podcast rode a bike with a helmet. You better say it. That's right. <laughs> Everybody on this podcast drunk water out of a water hose. 
Yeah. Do you know I had a little kid ring my doorbell playing outside the other day? Said, "Excuse me, do you have some bottled water?" <laughs> I said, "Excuse me, you better run around to the side and drink from that hose." Drink out the spigot. That's what's wrong. So, but we're not the spigot. Right. The spigot. So, yeah, spigot. Nikki, you you literally laid out the somewhat of the blueprint. In the Gibson household. Mm, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so I want to go ahead and um, see if if Myron got his AOL working now. I'm back what, 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 over there. Messed up the internet, the whole neighborhood. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Can so, you what you got, Myron? I'm good. Am I coming through clear? Is this you know, Bluetooth is working? Yeah. So listen, I want to say that uh, I learned integration, right? So in church we were spiritual. Outside of church we were not spiritual. There was abstinence in church, mm. but then there was something else outside of church. I grew up in New Orleans, 1999, Cash Money, dropped their greatest hit, Back That Ass Up. Y'all remember that song, right? Girl, you looking good? Oh, yeah. Back That Ass Up? Yeah.